Okay, we are live. Uh, let me just see anyone. Give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. All right, looking good. Excellent. Well, I want to thank everybody for being here. First of all, today, this is our discussion on fair housing and what it means for appraisers. We know it's been a very hot topic in a lot of ways, and it's important that we have these conversations to make sure that we're all on the same page and that we're all helping to move the industry forward the way that we'd like to. So we've got two really great panelists today joining us. Um, as a quick introduction first, my name is Steve Sussman. I serve as the Chief Business Development Officer here at NAN, Nationwide Appraisal Network. But the folks who are really the stars of the show today are the two ladies here to my Two ladies to my right, you can see Stacy Caprioli. Stacy is the chief appraiser at Nationwide Appraisal Network. And with a career in valuation spanning more than 15 years, Stacy's trained in both residential and commercial appraisals. She's passionate about the valuation industry, always working to advocate on behalf of the appraiser community and continually looking to strengthen our industry and help move it forward. Melissa Malpass is a consumer finance and fair lending attorney at Alston and Bird. She advises financial institutions on compliance with federal and state consumer financial laws. And Melissa regularly counsels mortgage lenders and financial institutions to help ensure compliance with things like the Truth in Lending Act, RESPA, Title IX. Basically, Melissa is not the attorney who gets you into trouble. She's the attorney who keeps you out of trouble. Um, so we've got really, really two very well qualified panelists to give us perspective on this, these topics here today. So I want to go ahead and dive right in, get us started. But as we start, I want to share with you very candidly, when we sent this out, we got a lot of feedback from the appraiser community coming into this call. A lot of it was positive. Uh, people appreciating the discussion, opportunity to get some guidance on how to avoid bias. But we got a few responses that were not so happy too. Some that were even pretty angry, just at the notion of having this discussion at all. Um, and I'll, I'll say to you, a few of those were so passionate, I can't read those emails out loud on this call. But I want to say we welcome all opinions here, all ideas, all thoughts on this topic. Discussion is healthy. It's only going to make all of us more informed, better equipped to solve the issues at hand. My only ask to all of you on the call today is to keep the feedback respectful and appropriate for the, the venue. And remember that we really are all on the same team, even if we have different ideas of how to get where we need to get. So feel free to enter questions in the chat box along the way, and we'll make sure we address them either during the conversation or as we wrap up at the end. But as you think of a question or a comment or something you want to make sure is discussed, go ahead and put it right into that chat box and uh, we'll keep an eye on it. So with that, Let's start out with a really important premise here today. Today is not about vilifying appraisers. OK, I want to be very clear about that. Most appraisers are good, honest, hardworking people, and we know that most appraisers have no intention of bias within their reports. At NAN, we've worked with appraisers for 19 years. We advocate strongly on the appraiser community's behalf and again, believe in the goodness of the appraiser community. So you may ask yourself then, well, why am I here, right? Appraisers are good, we don't have a problem. Well, there is some intentional bias, albeit rare. And while that does exist, I think we all know that that must be eradicated completely from our industry. Again, it's the exception and not the rule, but it is out there still. There's also unconscious bias. And unconscious bias doesn't just mean that, hey, I'm biased and I don't even know it. Unconscious bias means that there are ways in which in which a, um, a appraisal report can be done that reflect bias in the terminology that's used without intending to do so. We're going to talk a lot more about that at length. Um, so we need to understand how to look out for unconscious bias and how to avoid it. Because when we address this issue, we all on this call believe that everybody wins. The homeowners receive a fair valuation. The appraisers and the AMCs and the lenders avoid the substantial liability that comes with a biased report. And I think we can all agree when it comes to bias, one is too many, right? If it was you, if it was your friend, family, loved one on the wrong end of that, we know just how much that can affect people's lives. So we're here today not to point fingers, 
but to work to work out how can we move forward. So let's talk about that. And to get started, I, I want to go ahead and ask Stacy to start with the basics. Uh, can you tell us exactly, Stacy, what the Fair Housing Act is? Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Thank you to Melissa, who is joining us today to discuss. Um, Steve, if you want to go ahead and, and put up the verbiage for the Fair Housing Act, I can go over a brief um, overview of what the Fair Housing Act is. This may be a refresher for all of you as, that are sitting on the call, and thank you all for joining us. The Fair Housing Act is a primary tool for government and individual plaintiffs. This applies to lenders, AMCs, and appraisers. It prohibits discrimination by any person in connection with a residential real estate related transaction. So that is defined to include the appraising of residential real property. So that creates a liability for own conduct or for third parties. It's claims brought by individual plaintiffs as well as groups with organizational standing. And it also can bring penalties of up to $54,000 for violation of the Fair Housing Act. So beyond the legal terminology, there is a concept of Fair Housing Act that we want to make sure that we're reinforcing the importance of this. So from an appraisal standpoint, we want to look at how it is affecting the appraisal gap. So undervaluation is disproportionately affecting minority borrowers and neighborhoods. It is creating real life consequences for those affected, such as impeding the ability to purchase or refinance their homes. And appraisal discrimination lawsuits can be brought against individual appraisers, AMCs, and lenders. So we're looking at uh, a portion of our industry and we're saying that good intentions aren't enough anymore. We need to be proactive to be able to combat any bias that's happening right, right now. And it's not just an act of Congress. It is a concept of non-discrimination reflected in both the HUD Mortgage E-Letter 2021-27 and the USAP Opinion 16, which we'll hear about in the next coming slide. Thank you, Stacey. So the, the HUD mortgagee letter, um, you know, HUD regularly um, issues these letters for its mortgagees, its lenders, um, uh, to, you know, provide guidance on, you know, timely topics. And so while the Fair Housing Act has been around forever and uh, discrimination has been prohibited for a long time, um, HUD issued this mortgagee letter in November of 2021 to sort of emphasize the importance of you know, eliminating discrimination um, from the appraisal process. So it, first of all, it, uh, you know, emphasizes that the appraisal itself must comply with all federal, state, and local laws, um, including the Fair Housing Act and its, you know, state and local counterparts. Um, the appraiser must be knowledgeable and fully comply with all of those anti-discrimination laws. Um, and no part of the analysis or the reporting and the appraisal may be based on a number of um, prohibited characteristics, and they're all listed there, race, color, religion, sex, actual or perceived sexual orientation, et cetera. And that can be of the homeowner, of um, the borrower, if that's a different person, of the, I mean, we've even seen of the seller of the property um, bringing complaints under the Fair Housing Act. And um, it really can be of the individual Individual, their own protect prohibited, um, their own protected characteristic, or of the neighborhood in which the property is located. So there's a lot of different angles there. Um, and then for FHA rostered um, appraisers, um, HUD sort of emphasizes there that assignments must be performed in a competent, independent, impartial, and objective manner, and the appraiser must avoid practices that could affect the reliability of the reports, opinion, and conclusions. Um, and in addition to compliance with USPAP and the competency rule, the appraiser must not discriminate. Um, and we're even seeing, you know, in, in um, complaints, for example, um, you know, any um, failure to comply with a USPAP rule or principle as, you know, something that a complainant may, may say, you know, that's discriminating because of my race, you didn't comply with USPAP, that presents um, risk under the Fair Housing Act. And, and whether that, you know, failure to comply with any one of the numerous rules applicable to appraisers could, you know, lend itself to fair housing risk. Thanks. Thanks, um, Melissa. And, you know, it's really interesting as you guys talk about this, 
one of the things I heard Stacy say too was um, good intentions are no longer enough. And I think that cuts in a few different ways, right? It's when we look at ourselves, we need to recognize that good intentions aren't enough, that we need to we need to do better. But it's also that good intentions aren't enough to protect the appraiser community. And that's something I think we you know, need to be mindful of, that we have these conversations. It's not only to help make us all better, but it's also to look out for the appraisers and make sure that the appraisers are aware of what is being looked at and what those consequences can be. So you talked about the HUD mortgagee letter. Melissa, how about the um, USPAP advisory opinion 16, right? I know in developing and reporting appraisal or appraisal of view assignment, what should an appraiser consider to make sure that they are actually complying with the current fair housing laws? So the USPAP of advisory opinion 16, which um, has been around for a few years, you know, um, had some changes um, recently to, to sort of um, emphasize that, you know, the use of of terms and descriptive phrases in place of you know true factual information in a report um, is risky. Um, where where an appraiser feels like they you know can use um, a descriptive phrase or some terms that might be viewed as an opinion, um, they need to ensure. Um, that they, you know, not to do that when there are facts available. So if factual information is there, um, that's what you should use in a, in a report. Um, if factual information is absent, an appraiser should clearly disclose that fact that and that they're that they're using a descriptive phrase as an opinion, and that no factual information was available to support um, the, their descriptive phrase. It's it's a way to mitigate risk. Um, an appraiser shouldn't use unsupported conclusions relating to characteristics such as race, color, religion, national origin, any of those. Um, characteristics or really any proxy for those characteristics um, or any unsupported conclusion that homogeneity of those characteristics is what's needed to maximize the value. Um, the really interesting thing here, though, is that um, this advisory opinion um, uh, states that in some cases, even supported conclusions in assignments um, related to characteristics such as race, color, religion, all of those, or even if they don't specifically reference those characteristics, but um, use you know language that might be viewed as a proxy for those, um, it isn't prohibit is prohibited, even where the conclusion is otherwise supported. Um, the CFPB in a February 2022 letter to the Appraisal Foundation emphasized that the federal ban on discrimination isn't limited only to unsupported conclusions. Any discussion of prohibited bias should call attention to um, non-discrimination standards provided in federal law. And an appraiser's use or reliance on conclusions based on protected characteristics, regardless of whether the appraiser believes the conclusion to be supportable, constitutes illegal discrimination. Well, that's really interesting, Melissa, because I think it's hugely important takeaway that believing a statement to be true, and even sometimes when those conclusions are supported by the facts, is not always mm -hmm. enough to protect the appraiser from claims of discrimination. And you can see where things could get confusing. Things could, you know, again, good intentions, but can wind up in the wrong place. So, Stacy, let me ask you, can, as an appraiser yourself, can you help out with some examples of uh, what, where, where you would find the difference between opinion versus fact as it relates to what's acceptable in an appraisal? And so, let's, uh, maybe some examples here, starting with, you know, an opinion versus the fact, how they would differ. Yeah, sure, Steve. So one thing that I want to reiterate is what Melissa had mentioned about these words that carry as almost a proxy. So we want to look at some of the verbiage that we're including in our reports and try to support that verbiage or change that verbiage into a factual manner. So one of the items that you'll see here is states desirable neighborhood. So where that word desirable at one time may have been an acceptable descriptive word for a market area, it's no longer accepted by Fannie and Freddie as a word that we can be used in our appraisal report. So therefore just utilizing differing verbiage such as low days on market trends indicate demand within neighborhood boundaries, having supportive commentary that leads the reader to the days on market, the marketability of the homes, instead of utilizing the word desirable, for an example. 
Thanks, Stacy. And don't mind my my slide that has a mind of its own here. You can see the the uh, words are a little bit off, but hopefully you can take away here as Stacy explains what, what some of these are. Here's another one. Let's talk about homes in a neighborhood that are run down. How would you handle that one? Yeah, that's a good example also. So where, where there's an opinion of an area, we want to keep our responses and our verbiage in our reports as a neutral ground. So saying something like homes in the neighborhood are run down, we would want to change that and really focus on the factual factors in that market. So comparable search parameters within the neighborhood boundaries indicate condition ratings within the C4 category. However, some properties display C5 or C6 condition due to deferred maintenance. So these are supportable facts that can be looked up in MLS and when looking at comparable selection. Excellent. Thank you. How about subject is by a church, which impacts value? We've seen that before. What, what, what's, what would you do differently there? Yeah, this is a really common one as church also used to be an acceptable phrase to be utilized in our appraisal reports. But as things are changing, it is definitely a word that it tends to send for a revision request to the appraiser panel and, and ask to be reallocated to different verbiage. So one example of how I would place that would be subject is located proximate to religious facilities, paired analysis of homes within proximate proximities to similar commercial or non-residential uses indicate negative impact on value due to increased traffic patterns or noise. So again, supporting with factual basis looking at not just homes that have similar impact from a religious facility, but homes that may have similar impact from other externalities, that you can pull that adjustment out and you can indicate what truly is impacting the value there and focusing on the facts of the marketability versus the nature of the non-commercial surrounding external factor. No, that, that's very helpful. And again, this is a good example of how something can be true Right, subject is by a church which impacts value. That could very well be a fully true statement, but it still does not belong in an appraisal report because it can reflect unconscious bias. So there are better ways to remove any subjectivity from that statement by again using the example that, that Stacy gave on the right. And I, I see Todd has a question. I want to go ahead and pause for a second. Let me let me put that to our panel members here. Todd says. The wording of this would seem to allow for a complaint against an appraiser that uses all sales from a predominantly minority neighborhood as being racially biased. Even all the sales may be within blocks and extremely similar in physical characteristics. So how do we as appraisers defend against that? Uh, you know, I think that's a really fair, great question, right? So we want to ask um, how in this scenario, what can appraisers do to avoid running into trouble there? So yeah, I, 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 I oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Stacey. I was just going to say from an appraiser standpoint, you know, our comparable selection is the basis of everything that we do. So looking at the comparable selection, it really does come down to factors of not just the neighborhood, but you're also looking within proximity to similar external factors such as religious facilities. So if there is a comparable in the same market neighborhood that has the same factor, you're going to want to probably look at pulling adjustments from that paired analysis or look at utilizing that com comp if that is something that is truly a, a solid representation of market value. So I think it's, it's a really great question because there's a balance here. We need to be focused on the property at hand versus the you know style of neighborhood you're in. And we need to just word our selection to be supported by facts. And, and I'll add to Todd's question, you know, yes, you know, we see many complaints um, where um, comparables have been selected from, we do see them from the immediate neighborhood and you're, th there's still a chance you're going to get um, a complaint, but we've been pretty successful as long as, you know, they're within the parameters, you know, they're within the mile or the adjustments are within um, the, the appropriate, you know, parameters. And it's it's really when the appraiser goes out of their way to find, um, you know, properties that might have lower values, which 
you know, runs afoul of USPAP already, where we see that there's um, more risk. Typically, if, if you know, USPAP standards are followed and things are done as they're supposed to be, the, um, the fair lending risk is lower. But, you know, there's still a chance because of that unsupported language. Um, uh -huh. And then on the, the question about church versus religious organization, I think um, Stacy's point in referring to the religious organization was sort of like the focus on, you know, there may be traffic or something and that could have a negative value. It wasn't really about what type of uh, religious organization it is. And, you know, when you say church, well, there's also temple, synagogue, et cetera. And so you don't really need that level of detail when you're just trying to get to the point that there is, you know, a building that's going to attract, you know, traffic that might, you know, negatively affect the value. It's not really about the type of religion, you know, religious structure itself. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, Melissa. And I think also to add to that, we really have to just focus on how much commentary we're putting in our reports as appraisers and make sure that our commentary is really supportive and strong and that if you're choosing comparables from the same market, there's an explanation behind that reconciliation and, and behind that comparable search, as well as any external obsolescence or any external factors that come into play. We, we want to make sure that we are supporting our conclusions with factual commentary in a really strengthened basis. And, and that's often what's going to lead to a more robust report, a more repeatable and defendable report at the end of the day, is how much commentary you're putting into that, that explanation. All really great discussion. And, and I appreciate the, the challenging questions because that's what's yeah. real. That's what's on people's minds. And that's what we need to be able to address as an industry. So um, I wanna ask, pose one more here that came in from yep. Nicholas. And can, can it be that, a being near a place of worship is a good thing, right? Like I know, Stacy, in your example, you talked about negative impact due to traffic patterns, but is there is there bias concern by, by saying that there's actually a positive influence from being near a place of worship? No, not at all. I think that, again, as long as you can support that conclusion with a paired analysis and explain to the reader in a factual manner how that is impacting the marketability of the home, then that is acceptable. I think that you can use comparisons to other properties that might have similar external factors that are contributing a beneficial marketability in order to get to that, that root cause of, of any sort of adjustment. So no, I think that really it comes down to one way or another. If you are looking at externalities that may have a positive if, or externalities that may cause a negative, you really do have to look at how that is factually determined based outside of just the opinion of the appraiser on site. So I think that's a great question and it's something that we have to look at in our comparable selection. Really helpful. Thank you, Stacy. And um, I, Adriano posed a question. I think we can kind of broaden that question a little bit too, which is, Stacy, you used the example of religious facility. Um, someone, someone might call it a, a house of prayer. Someone might call it a place to worship. Are there, do we, how careful do we need to be? And is there a true right and wrong for how to describe what we're, what we're talking about? Or is it okay to use different terminologies like the ones given here as examples? Here, Melissa, I don't, I don't know if you wanted to take this one from your aspect. Well, yeah, I guess I wanted to say like a little bit is, is you know, trying to mitigate risk and using some common sense and, and looking at how you consistently approach your appraisal work and for example if it's a historically black church and i'm just going to be very you know straightforward here if it's a historically black church and you are marking that as a negative because of traffic you know you need to be careful if that's not what you're doing when it is a um, a non-historically black church or some other or some other religious organization. And really, is it really about proximity to community amenities? Is that really what we're talking about? You know, is that a good thing? And, or are we talking about the negative of the traffic without having to any, every word that's put in, you, it's a balance. You need sufficient, you know, commentary to explain anything that looks remotely like an opinion, but you also have to, you know, carefully choose your words um, to not set yourself up for, um, for you know a complaint for example so you know i didn't i i can't give you the answer <laughs> but that's that's basically you know the, the idea 
And, and I yeah, think that's, that's a great point. Real... Oh, go ahead, Stacey. Oh, sorry, Stacey. I was just going to add that, you know, Fannie Mae Selling Guide does have a list of words that they use as a primary selection, which can be referenced. And that's a good place to kind of look at how you're wording things and then go into their suggested verbiage and see if there's something that you could adapt in your commentary to make it a little bit more neutral. Um, so that's definitely a suggestion that I would make if you're kind of looking to adapt your language in your reports and, and adapt the way that you want to word things. It, it's a great reference point to start with. And I'll point out that I think our third training session that we are planning is completely devoted to this topic. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> to the yes, text and commentary an topic. topic. So we will and, be uh, armed and ready to kind of go through any all questions on that. <laughs> and I think that there was, you know, really some honest dialogue there. And Melissa, at one point, you gave a very detailed explanation and then said, but really, I don't know, you know, because there is some ambiguity when it comes to what's okay, house of worship versus, you know, uh, religious institution and so on. And I think the idea is that right now the best practice is to try to strip it down to the most simple factual way of describing what it is um, and to just be cognizant of even though there's not a hard written rule right now that says you can say this word for a house of worship but you can't say this one that to to think about how can i avoid having any kind of trouble what's the simplest way to describe this in a factual manner so all really helpful and some great comments going back and forth here um, in the chat, so I encourage you all to read some of the opinions here coming in from from our guests. I think some really helpful dialogue. So let's let's keep forging ahead, though. Again, we're going to hit hit more on this topic uh, in, in time to come. Let's talk about you know because we're we're all we're talking about challenging things, right? There are some things that are kind of contradictory, and, and I want to point this out. And Melissa, I'll put you on the spot as our our legal expert. We're talking about all these things that we need to be wary of and that we need to be careful of, but how do we reconcile it with language in the Fair Housing Act that seems to run counter, right? It, it, nothing prohibits a person engaged in the business of furnishing appraisals of real property to take into consideration factors other than race, color, religion, national origin, sex, handicap, or familial status. Now, I don't see anywhere in there that it says you can't say it's a high crime neighborhood or you can't say that it's near a church, you know, and you know, I know Diana's posing the question, where's this list of words that we should and shouldn't use? And I know that that list just doesn't exist. So how do we square this when the Fair Housing Act would seem to allow for one thing, but now we're saying, hey, there's a lot more that we have to be wary of. So you're right that, you know, the Fair Housing Act, you know, purports to offer this, you know, somewhat of a safe harbor, right? That if you can consider anything else, just not these types of characteristics or traits. Now, in practice, you know, the the HUD complaint process, for example, um, any complaint that is lodged, HUD has an, an opportunity, you know, a, an obligation to investigate it. And the idea is if a complainant thinks that you discriminated, it, it the burden becomes on you know the defendant the respondent the, whether it be the lender the amc or the appraiser to demonstrate that these factors weren't used in the appraisal process and so you know part of this you know obviously is doing the right thing but a, a large component as well um is mitigating risk and through you know the commentary used or through any chit chat with the um with the homeowner is to ensure that you know, nobody can draw that inference there that that perhaps, you know, the under you know, a value lower than anticipated was, um, you know, caused by some sort of racial bias or animus. Um, and so that's really the 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 balancing act here. Thank you, Melissa. And again, it's not an easy question to answer because we find ourselves right in the middle of this evolution that's happening, not at a place where we've settled on all the answers yet. But that's why it's so important to have these conversations and, and make sure we all get on the same page. And, and I think one of the things we need to acknowledge too is that just like most things in this world, this is a topic that can easily become politicized. Um, we've seen it go all the way up to the president of the United States, bringing up the notion of appraisal bias and concerns with it. And anytime that happens, of course, it can easily wind up seeing becoming like a right versus left uh, question. And 
rather than being a political initiative, though, I think it's important we recognize that there are nonpartisan studies that have taken place. And the one that I would cite is from the Brookings Institute. And I, the reason I use them is because they've been around for more than 100 years. They are the most frequently cited think tank in the country. And there's actually a study that's been done that they're almost exactly equally cited by conservatives as they are by liberals. So it's clearly not an organization that inherently is biased politically in one way or the other. And they conducted a study of how racial bias in appraisals affects the devaluation of homes in majority black neighborhoods. And what they concluded was bias in the appraisal process may account for some of the discrepancy. And again, it's not because appraisers are bad, this is what's happening, but because of inherent bias within the way appraisals are performed, some of the discrepancy here can be blamed on that. So it's important to remember that this is not a left versus right issue, it's a right versus wrong, right? We want to avoid bias. Any, any political persuasion should be able to agree on that. So when we, when we talk about that though, and this is what I really want to ask for both of your perspectives because it's been such a significant shift. Appraisals, you know, they were in the spotlight back in 2008. And here we are again, 15 years later, but this time it feels like a very different focus. So let me start with you, Stacey. Can you tell me from an appraiser's perspective, what's different now versus 2008? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Nicole. So first and foremost, we are in 2008. We were really focused on an overvaluation, as as that was happening in our industry. And now the shift is really turned to focusing on undervaluation, just as equally as the overvaluation. So how do we avoid both? And that's the question that we pose to ourselves as appraisers. And and we want to make sure that the appraisal is just right, as noted here. And we do that by utilizing technology, by accessing the Fannie and Freddie SSR CU scores, looking for those over and under valuation flags, strengthening our quality control processes, um, utilizing MLS and public records in your market, staying you know, connected with your peers on trends. Those are things that we want to look at because we're not just focused on the overvaluation at this point. We are focused on the undervaluation and we want to make sure that all appraisals are coming in at a fair, fair level. Thanks, Stacey. So, Melissa, you know, we talk about understanding the problem here, right? Because the, the tone has shifted so much. So tell, tell me a little bit more about why this focus has shifted. What are, what are we seeing from a, a, a legal side? Well, with, you know, a lot of this has to do sort of just with the market and when homes are, you know, housing values are high, you know, undervaluation hurts because you're not able to access, you know, equity, you're not able to, it's, we, we've seen such an increase, for example, in, in undervaluation complaints in the refinance context. People want to cash out refi to do something with the money and and they can't access the equity in their house and, and prices are so high. Why can't they? Um, back in 08, you know, the overvaluation um, concern after the crash. And so overvaluation continues to be an issue particularly where there's a overvaluation of you know for example majority white neighborhoods and an undervaluation in minority neighborhoods so we still have to be cognizant of both but the undervaluation really um increases redlining risk this idea that certain neighborhoods can't access um credit they're not being served in the same way as as other neighborhoods and the bias towards lower values in certain in certain neighborhoods does reinforce and perpetuate inequalities. Thank you, Melissa. And you mentioned that term redlining. I, let's dive in a little bit more. What exactly is redlining and, and why does it exist in the first place? Sure. So um, in terms of lenders, um, you know, we the first, you know, redlining cases, um, like in the 80s and 90s, they focused on con bank conduct going all the way back to the 70s. And it was basically financial institutions that would draw a red line on their maps um, to denote areas, uh, neighborhoods that they did not want to go into to serve. Um, and 
really they didn't come up with this. Um, the, the government itself with the Homeowners Loan, Co Loan Corporation did it first, um, grading um, certain neighborhoods as high risk or hazardous. And, you know, many of those were minority neighborhoods and they are the they are minority and the LMI, in, uh, LMI neighborhoods, low to moderate income neighborhoods we see today. Um, and so most of those graded hazardous areas consisted primarily of minority owned homes um, and still do today. Um, and property valuation was used to prevent Black Americans from accessing the suburbs and accessing um, government mortgage money. So um, it's really, this, the issue is really bigger than just at the individual appraiser level. Um, the, you know, there are various participants here. And even as recently as 2016, HUD's own guidelines explicitly required its FHA rostered appraisers to evaluate the desirability of a neighborhood um, based on, you know, the, the demographics, whether there was a positive or negative effect on the value due to gentrification. So neither gentrification nor desirability are words that should be used anymore. And, and the GSEs, you know, will say that now, but 2016 was really not that long ago. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Melissa. And this is where I think, again, we need to be fair to the appraiser community. If you're receiving guidelines that tell you one thing and you do that for years following those guidelines, you shouldn't be vilified now, right? Now is the time, okay, we can evolve the guidelines. We can say we need to make some change, but we need to understand where this is all rooted from um, and and the reason why we are where we are. So really, really valuable to know, again, like you said, 2016 was not that long ago. Um, and I know that the, the GSEs are doing tons of research on this. Uh, let me ask you, Stacey, let's start with the Freddie Mac study. W what did they find in, in their study of, of bias in appraisals? Yeah, so Steve, the Freddie Mac racial and ethnic, ethnic valuation gaps in home purchase appraisals from January 21 and May 22, you can see here they have some pretty distinct responses to that research in that homes in my uh, majority black neighborhoods are 1.7 times more likely to receive an appraisal below the final contract price. They had some verbiage in that in that study that indicates we conduct exploratory research to begin to understand what causes the observed gaps for minority versus white tracks. And they identified that the factors that are primary in that are comp distance, comp reconciliation, comp variance. So these are the areas that as appraisers, we want to strengthen our supportive commentary and make sure that we are looking at the distances, we are looking at the reconciliation, and we're looking at that those variances between the comps selected to make sure that we're covering, you know, all of that factual data. And even when taking in the structural and neighborhood characteristics into consideration, a property is more likely to receive an appraisal lower than contract price if it's in a minority tract. So that was found that it, the likelihood increases as the Black or Latino concentration in the neighborhood increases. So that, that study gave us a lot to, to adapt on. And I think kind of playing off of what Melissa was talking on in the last slide, you know, from 2016 until now, it really is important for us to really review our letters of engagement when we are engaged on these projects because the verbiage can change and it can change very rapidly. Yeah, really, really helpful. Thank you. It's very interesting how they stripped away kind of all the other possible factors to really get down to it and what they came out with. And I know that Fannie's conducted studies too. At, and they're appraising the appraisal study. What did, what did Fannie find? So that study was released in January of 2022. And again, some really interesting facts that came out of this. According to an analysis of 1.8 million recent appraisals, Black borrowers refinancing their homes receive lower appraisal values relative to AVM. So while white borrowers refinancing their homes receive a higher appraisal value relative to those models. So taking all of those backlogged um, appraisals and really reviewing the trends that has resulted in some key factors here. Um, inaccurate functional and external property characteristic descriptions have created understated values. So again, supporting the the facts that we're putting into our reports. And in both cases of overvaluation and undervaluation, appraisals had issues in comp selection, which was established on the prior slide, comp adjustments and differences of quality, condition, age, parking, and amenities. 
So again, really looking at how we are doing our adjustment analysis and our comp analysis and making sure that the reader, not just the first initial reader, but every reader from here on out through the GSEs can understand how everything was determined in a factual basis. And homes owned by white borrowers in majority black neighborhoods were more likely to be overvalued. So just some really interesting facts that, that have come up from these GSC studies that we can take into consideration as we continue these conversations. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. And I've got a couple of really good questions coming in in the chat. First one, I'm not sure if we have an answer to, but let me pose it to, to the panel here. Um, asking if any of these studies take into consideration that maybe there are, there are offering more than asking in order to get the house in some of these cases. And I know that they really tried to strip away all of the outside factors, but do you, did either of you happen to know particularly if that one was something that's been addressed? I personally am not certain about whether or not they particularly address that. And from when these studies were first released, I think that, you know, last year really established a totally different industry market for all of us, where there was a higher um, demand in certain markets and people were overbidding and that became a factor in a lot of our market analysis that we're seeing now and putting it into our declining and increasing commentary. So I would not be surprised if that becomes a factor in some of these conversations going forward. No, thank you, Stacey. I, I, I think the on, last Melissa. study that I that I, so some of these studies that we're talking about today are looking at the gap between the AVM and the appraisal, you know, the opinion of value and the appraisal. Um, the last one that I saw that looked at like the hitting the mark sort of on on the purchase contract um, price um, was sort of in a different market. So I agree that that would be interesting to see if that was done now, what it would show. Thank you, Melissa. It was a few and, years ago. You know, a good question from Diana here again, because the appraisers are working in good faith and it's like, how do we not step on a landmine, right? So. What are you supposed to say when you're in an area that you know is being restored and upgraded, and that's resulting in the displacement of the lower income residents that were there prior? You know, the appraiser's job is to tell the client what's happening in the market and to give them an honest assessment of what's happening, but they're also prohibited from using some of that terminology. So what 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 do you do? How do you steer clear but still do right by the client, you know, meaning the lender? That's a great question. So in my opinion as an appraiser, I think the focus there is that we we look at the difference of growth and the difference of land use, and we really break our analysis down to that factual basis where we're looking at how are the changes being made? Are they being made per zoning? Are they transitioning from a primarily residential neighborhood to including more commercial? Are they including more multifamily? Um, we really need to look at the growth and stability and land use and the ability to access kind of our neighborhood boundaries and determine, you know, what goes into the, that area. So from my perspective, you know, and again, this is, it's still a fluid conversation of how we handle these situations. Um, I will always say you reference back to your letter of engagement, reference back to any language that your, your lender client is not looking to have included and really focus on the changes that are being made. How is it affecting the marketability? How are the changes to that area, you know, impacting, you know, market adjustments for location or for site size, um, you know, pull an analysis for your sites and, and look at how sites are being determined. And, and that can really come down to the breakdown of your adjustments. So in my, in my opinion, I think that you can support pretty much anything in your report from a neutral basis as long as you have the facts to back it. And, I, and, and I'm not an appraiser, but I think the focus would need to be on like what's happening to the properties that are there. You know, are they being torn down and there's, you know, new construction, these huge, like, you know, lots of huge square footage properties and more focus on that and less on the displacement of lower income residents that I see in the question, because that's not really, you know, the relevant factor, it should be more the properties and what's happening, that, what's making them restored and upgraded. I don't know if that helps. Uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not an appraiser, but just as a, from a, from a risk perspective, um, that's where I think the focus should be. That's a great point, Melissa. I think from a condition and quality standpoint, as renovations are being made, that inherently going to change your comparable selection for some homes because we all know that if we start expanding out our 
our areas and searching for comparables that have you know similar conditions of renovated nature you're going to have to change out kind of your comp selection but again everything needs to be supported and i and i agree i think it needs to focus more on the true changes of the neighborhood from a, a structural aspect versus what's happening with the the people in that market thank you guys and we've got some really good feedback coming in and again it's okay for some of this feedback to be a uh, frustration or disagreeing like that that's healthy this is how we grow and, and I know that, Diane, I know you're concerned with hearing the, you know, the answer to the question. I think the answer, though, is that there's not necessarily an exact answer. And that, that's some of the challenge here. And, I, and you all as appraisers, I'm sure, know that appraising is, you know, it's part science and it's part an art form at the same time. Uh, there's, some, there's some matter of, you know, different appraisers viewing things from a different lens. And that's going to be a challenge here going forward, too, is that, there's not always an exact right answer. And we're just trying to kind of, as an industry, figure out what are the general best practices and how do we how do we guide that? How do we get there? Um, same thing, Nicholas, when you talk about the different factors that were uh, studied as part of these, these studies that we're citing. And, and Todd, bringing up a great point. There's question about confirmation bias, about methodology, credibility. Absolutely, there is no definitive right and wrong answer. There's no one perfect study that looks at everything just right. There's no there's no one absolutely correct answer. But I think what we do find is that there are clearly noticeable trends, right? Each study conducted a little bit differently, looking at different things, looking at you know millions of appraisals, is coming to similar conclusions. And is are there details in there that may change the results of those somewhat sure in each one there could be some fluctuation but over and over and over we're seeing the same general conclusion and and you know they say the numbers don't lie right so when we talk about what do the numbers show it's not just in those studies and, and some of it are things that really aren't subjective you know you look at uh gaps when when looking at the race of the mortgage applicant as opposed to the neighborhoods the homes were in so 8.6% of black applicants received appraisals lower than contract price of the house, 9.5% of Latino applicants, but only 6.5% of white applicants, which again would be a statistically significant number. And the one that you know I think is really striking that we we can look at here, and it's hard to really hard to really look at this and say that there's not some problem. Again, wherever it lies, that's the question. But when we look at the percentage of purchase appraisals below contract price, uh, again, by track percent of minority population, right? So the blue line means that it's fewer than 50% minority population, the orange line 50 to, to 80, and the gray line 80 to 100. And those lines so consistently track across all different markets, across all different environments that we found ourselves in all the way back to 2013, where consistently it's the 80 to 100 percent minority population areas that are finding contract prices coming in lower at a higher rate. So again, when you look at the numbers, it's not about saying here's the reason why there's a problem, but it's about saying let's acknowledge that there is a problem. Um, and, 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 I'll, and I'll add, I, I, if we have time, uh, to yeah. Todd's confirmation bias question, I agree with you. Um, you know, every participant in the industry has a different stake in this game. And Fannie and Freddie, you know, they have their own automated tools. So they're not going to knock their automated tools. They're trying to look at, you know, what the appraiser's doing wrong. And, you know, everybody's kind of, there's a little bit of finger pointing, but I think um, to Steve's point, everybody, th there's an issue and now everybody's just trying to figure out, you know, how to resolve it without, you know, totally dismantling everything. Um, but there are, there, you know, there are methodologies that everybody is using that are all, that are, that are all different. And then if you ask the regulators, they don't like, sometimes they don't like the automated tools. Sometimes they think that traditional appraisers should be, appraisals should be replaced with automated tools. So, um, there's definitely uh, not a consensus on that. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. Very helpful. And Stacey, let me ask you a question. Uh, you know, something I saw from from Richard here, because it brings up a good point. You know, the the appraiser is the expert, not the AVM. And of course, the appraiser doesn't want to appraise to match an AVM. 
But you know, given that we're talking about some of these concerns, is it a good practice for an appraiser to keep an AVM with a property or a screenshot from Zillow or something to in the work file that shows that you know, they are reflective of what the you know, what these these um, these automatic valuations would would also show? Yeah, I absolutely think that if you have access to some of those resources, it's a great due diligence to pull them on the properties that you're looking at. And a lot of AVMs are interactive, so you can look at your comparable selection through the AVM and really narrow down your comparable selection to get that AVM in a market area. I think that sometimes what you know lenders look at with an AVM, they, they want to see that it is supported. And that's what the appraisal is truly for. And that's the difference between the AVMs and the appraisal is that as the, the professional in the market, you have the ability to impart that sort of expertise on adjustments and why things are going to be adjusted versus an AVM. Um, but I do think that any sort of backing to your research that you might pull on a property that you feel comfortable including in your work file or including in your report that is supportive of your conclusion, absolutely beneficial. It's beneficial to have that understanding for any reader who's going to grab that report. I think that's a great question. Thank you, Stacy. And Carlo, I will just share with you, I know you, you, you asked the question about minorities becoming the majority in some areas. and. Is that the, then how do you describe the minority community? And I think what we need to be careful of is to not lump in all non-white folks as becoming the majority just because there may be fewer, there may be more non-white people in a market. If you look at the plurality, if you look at the breakdown, let's say that there's 30% black and there's 30% uh, Latino population, but there's 40% white population it's still the majority would be considered the the ethnicity that makes up the most of that of that area. So it's not so, so simple as just looking at, you know, white versus non-white neighborhoods. We're still looking at what is the overall population reflective of. So fair question, but again, we need to look at look at it from the the big picture, not just um, in a smaller smaller area. So let's look. We talk about the numbers. Um, telling the story. The question, though, is what's being done to actually help? And, and Melissa, let me start with you. You know, and and this is always a, a scary thing to ask, right? What's the government doing to help? Nobody wants to hear that question. But in this instance, what is the government doing to try to push us in the right direction? Okay, I'll try to go through this. You know, briefly, as it might not be the most exciting slide, but um, the um, Federal Housing Finance Agency, which is the conservator for Fannie and Freddie. Um, they kind of put out a request for input from the industry to see how they could, you know, modernize the appraisal process. And their report in December 2021, again, really focused on the type of commentary that they were seeing in reports and, and the language. And, and, and we, I think that we'll talk about that more in a future session. Um, th th we know about the White House initiative um, that was signed on day one of the new administration, you know, advancing racial equity. Um, and that led to the creation of the Interagency Task Force on Property Appraisal and Valuation Equity, PAVE. And they came out with their action plan, which I'll say is um, kind of outside the box thinking for what to do going forward. They came up with potential um, solutions that they're going to be assessing and evaluating, including expanding the use of alternatives to traditional appraisals, um, the use of value estimate ranges instead of an exact amount. And I don't really like that they that they even call it an exact amount because there's so much, um, you know, in an appraisal report that'll tell you, you know, this is an opinion of value. This is based on the appraiser's uh, expertise and judgment. So it's not like you're trying to get it down to the dollar, but um, they're they're looking at uh, use of value estimate ranges, um, which could be a good way to mitigate uh, risk um, on the um, lending industry side. Um, the potential use of alternatives and modifications to the sales comparison approach um, and publicly sharing aggregated historical appraisal data. Um, and then finally, the appraisal subcommittee hearing, which was very recent, um, you know, the, the appraisal it, it, regulatory regime 
was described as uh, Byzantine, which is not, you know, the most favorable uh, term to use. It tells you perhaps a little bit what um, some of the people on the on the committee think of <laughs> the appraisal industry, but it really has to do with the funding of the uh, appraisal foundation and how you get on the board and how you create standards for appraisers. Um, so everything is being looked at here and scrutinized to determine what the answer should be. Um, and then I can go on to the next slide, uh, Steve. Or, yeah, thanks, uh, Lisa, I think the next slide is important because when we talk about, you know, what's being done to help, well, rules and regulations are only as good as the enforcement of those rules and regulations. So whose job is it to, to enforce these? How does that work? So um, HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, has primary authority to enforce the Fair Housing Act, um, along with uh, DOJ, who handles, you know, um, complaints or issues once they become more of a pattern of practice. Um, HUD's Office of the of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, um, they enforce the Fair Housing Act, and one primary tool that they have is third-party nonprofit organizations. Um, and there's, you know, if you ask a lot of uh, lenders um, that, you know, for example, that I've been representing in some of these complaints, they say, well, that's a huge conflict of interest to have these nonprofits being funded by HUD to go out and, and help and bring complaints. And and it, it is somewhat, <laughs> but um, the, so these local organizations, um, they will, you know, work with consumers who have complaints, they'll find these complaints, they'll help uh, bring the complaints to HUD. Um, and since 2019, um, HUD has received tenfold increase in appraisal related discrimination reports and complaints. And I would um, uh, think that it's even higher now. Um, they haven't come out public, public publicized their um, most recent data. Um, but, you know, with the rise in housing uh, prices and all that, we've been seeing a lot of complaints. Um, on the refinance side with borrowers who um, didn't receive the as high of an appraisal as they would have hoped. Um, complaints are filed with HUD directly against appraisers as well as AMCs and lenders. Usually, you know, all three parties are, are involved. Thank you, Melissa. I know we're running up on time. We've got some, some questions here. I try to get to what I can. I think one, one good question that I see though is, has there been a bias complaint where value was not at the forefront? Or are there other ways that bias has come through that have caused a complaint to happen when a report didn't come in under contract price? Is that, are, are either of you aware of seeing any anything like that? So I'll say that, you know, of the dozens that we are, are handling, they are all about the value. <laughs> um, because if the value came in, um, high enough, then there's not really anything to complain about. Um, I, I mean, and that's not true. There could be, there could have been discrimination in another aspect of the transaction or, the, you know, or the process. But at the end of the day, um, if the value um, supports what the complaint, you know, what the borrower or the homeowner was looking for, you know, you're less likely it's, to receive a complaint. No, that, that's fair. That I, I think it's also, you know, we should note that when you're talking about an appraisal report, there aren't a whole heck of a lot of ways that bias would come through if it's not in value. So, you know, yes, there certainly could be instances where somebody is just upset they didn't get their value and looking for, you know, a reason to blame it on. But at the same time, if there's going to be bias in a report, it's most likely going to come through in, in how value is, is uh, relayed. So, Again, there's two sides to all of it, and it's it, there's a lot of nuance in the middle, and that's, I think, the important takeaway from everything that we've talked about today. But I'd like to ask Stacy, you know, when we, when we say, well, what are some key takeaways that appraisers can can use here from today when it comes to preventing bias, when it comes to doing their part to help for our industry and doing what they need to do to protect themselves? What What would you say are some key takeaways? Yeah, that's a great question, Stephen. I, I see some of the comments that are coming in, and I, and I want everybody to know that we have some bias complaints that do come in from a compliance standpoint. And so where it may not have gone all the way to a legal aspect, we do have some bias that comes in from different inspection levels that may happen. And we take that very seriously and we do an investigation. So it may not be about the value in all cases that we're seeing at the AMC level. Um, but I do agree with Melissa that it tends to be the forefront of those conclusions. But the 
the few things that I want to reiterate then is that appraisers should carry out their obligations in a non-discriminatory manner in accordance with federal and state fair housing laws and must carefully avoid both conscious and unconscious bias. So just sticking with the ethical basis of our profession, making sure that we lead with professionalism, accuracy, making sure our reports are repeatable and defendable. Um, we should not in any way reference the homeowners. So nothing about race, ethnicity, demographic composition of the neighborhood. Um, avoid those in your reporting that can cause you know, issues down the line and, and also be flagged. And one thing that we really do suggest and, and can be the root of some of those initial bias claims is substantive small talk or off-topic conversations. So I know as an appraiser, you know, we enter into people's homes and it's, it's difficult to not have that small talk and communicate with the homeowners. But we just would suggest that you limit that communication to things that are specific to the job you're there to do. Um, that oftentimes when there's other conversations happening, that can lead to misunderstandings, misinterpretation, and that often leads to the borrowers or the homeowners or sellers or realtors um, claiming there may be some bias at hand because of a of a situation that you may have been in. So those are just some some specifics that I would raise as just looking for changes in your everyday practice. Um, but overall, I think that the conversations that we've had today and some of the comments that have been placed really are, you know, opening this conversation and we value all of the appraiser panel's opinions. And so I, I welcome everybody to continue to add that com conversation in for us so that we can keep this going. And Thank I would just add here. to this slide one more thing yeah. um, that, that appraisers can do is if you receive, you know, um, comparables suggested as part of a reconsideration of value request um, to, you know, take them seriously in the sense that, you know, they're they're properly addressed in, in your comments as to why you may not have included a particular property because it's not comparable. It's just another area where um, if, if if you don't uh, provide enough support, it could, um, you know, uh, it, it could demonstrate, you know, some risk there, fair lending mm -hmm. risk. We've seen that, and I agree with the small talk as well. You know, we've seen complaints where there was a, the, the value came in lower than expected, and really the only other comment was that the appraiser, you know, m made a comment and said that the uh, decor was a bit interesting. So. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, another you know. example of good intentions not always having right. a good outcome, right? So right. really helpful feedback. And and I think, you know, as we, we look to wrap up, I know we're up, up against time here. One of the questions we, we should really take away is how can we each do better when it comes to bias? And when I say each of us, I mean from each different perspective, right? And I'll start with the AMCs because that's me. So let, let's take a look inside first. We need to listen. We need to listen to the concerns from the GSEs. We need to listen to the concerns from the appraisers. We need to take all of them seriously and we need to be willing to be open-minded to hear everybody out and to learn. And from that learning, because we do act as the bridge between lenders and the appraiser community, we need to educate. We need to be able to share perspectives. Some of the great comments that we got in here um, are fair questions that we should be posing back. And at the same time, the appraisers need to hear some tough questions sometimes too. So it's up to us to educate and to speak up. When we see something that is a false narrative or we see something that is not being recognized, that's a problem. The AMCs need to do our part as a, a, a neutral party that sits between the lenders and the appraisers to speak up and to be honest about what's happening in the industry. How about government? There's a lot we could ask government to do better, but let's start with study the issue, right? Fair, unbiased studies, not to reach a, a foregone conclusion, but to get to the truth. And it's hard to do a study that removes any kind of outside influence, even with the best of intentions. But we keep trying and we keep we need to keep studying the issue and learning more. And government should know to stop painting appraisers with a broad brush. You know, the, the discussion is too often focused on bias of the appraisers and not often focused on flaws within the system that the appraisers must work within. We need to look at all areas in which bias can come up and how we resolve it. The government also needs to help update best practices. You saw some of these rules, regulations, 
just from a few years ago that fly right in the face of what we're saying to do now, and that there are some that contradict each other that still exist. Again, we need to be honest about this and say that, yes, we are in a period of change, but ultimately we need clear guidance for the appraiser community to make good decisions. And how about the appraisers? Well, appraisers, first thing we need to ask is that you acknowledge the issue, right? And I think it's a natural thing for appraisers to sometimes feel defensive about this issue because the implication is, am I being biased? No, I'm not being biased, right? But we need to acknowledge that there is a systemic issue that occurs and not so much look again to, to place fault, but to look at how do we fix it? And we need the appraisers to maintain dialogue. You know, it, it, it doesn't help for appraisers to only go into appraiser chat rooms and talk with each other about the frustrations of the situation at hand. We need to, we need this, we need interaction where the lenders and the appraisers and the AMCs and, and the GSEs and everybody is having that real dialogue with one another to understand one another. We also need your expertise. If we're going to improve the system, who knows better how to do that than the appraisers, the folks on the ground who are living it every day. So again, being here to share your expertise to help solve the problem. And finally, being open to change. Um, change is hard. And, and some, it, some of these changes may not be changes that you personally agree with, but being open to the changes in the spirit of helping push the industry forward. So what it comes down to all of us, we need to consider each other's perspectives. We need to focus on solutions, not finger pointing. And most importantly, we need to remember it's not us versus them. It's all of us versus bias. And hopefully that is something that we can all agree on. So with that, I want to thank everybody for being here today, joining us. I want to thank our presenters who have done a fantastic job navigating a truly challenging issue that doesn't have a clear script of right or wrong. Um, and I want to be clear that this is not the end of the conversation. This is the beginning. We intend to host more forums. I hope you'll tell your friends to come and join, your colleagues, your peers, folks who agree with the issue, disagree with the issue. Um, we don't want to be in an echo chamber here. We want to hear honest feedback and we want to share honest feedback. So again, these discussions are hugely important. We appreciate all of you. A big, big thank you to our presenters today, and we look forward to meeting again with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. Please feel free to reach out to us through that email address with any follow up. Thank Absolutely. you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.